Which before I say any more, we can flip to the switch to give you a little teaser of what this amazing show is all about, in case you haven't seen it before. That gives me goosebumps just to see that teaser video. Cavalia it was the first show that was produced and toured the world. Over four million people have seen it. The images that you were just seeing is from Odiseo, the second production, which, as we'll hear, is quite different from the original production. So to maybe kick it off, Norman, where did where did this idea of Cavalia come from? And how do you take it from your imagination to reality? Yeah, well, um, where it's coming from, like I was one of the co-founder of Cirque du Soleil. And when I moved out of Cirque du Soleil, I wanted to do something different. And uh, I created a show. I'm from Montreal, Canada, uh, French part of Canada. And uh, I created a show uh, that required few horses as extra over there in Canada. And it was an outside show in the summer. And so, and uh, when the horse, it was not a horse show. It was not a show about horses. It was a show about French Canadian tales. Uh, and there was a lot of performers, 120 performers on stage. And at one point when the horses were coming on stage, not doing a lot, just riding across the stage, uh, people were looking at the horse, not the performers. So that attracted my attention. I said, you know, that's very interesting. So my director at that time, I did not direct the show. The director at that time came to me and said, we got to get rid of this horse. He's stealing focus. <laughs> of course, this is where the first bell rang in my head and say, if he's stealing focus, it's because he's, an, uh, uh, you know, he's a, we, we, in French, we say in bed the same, a beast of stage. The translation is not totally 
good, but you know, you might get the principle of it. So, you know, like when we say a, a, an actor is stealing focus from the other actor, is we call him a bed the same, like he's a beast on stage. So, I said this is this is I said oh, we should get more horses instead of get rid of the horses. So I started to buy horses because in Canada, obviously, probably because of the weather, and we don't have a lot of horses, and and you know it's getting very cold during the winter, so we have. To have inside, you cannot leave the horse outside. So, uh, so we didn't have any performing horse. So I had to buy horses to hand more horses to this show, and this is where the ID started to grow up. And when I got myself the proud owner of twelve horses, I said, "Well, maybe I should do a little more than just one horse, one show during the summer." And this is where I, I started to have the idea. So maybe we can do something artistic with the horse. So how? You know, and, and this is where I get very excited is how I can, like we did with Cirque, reinvent something or invent something that doesn't exist. And this is where I got very excited say, you know, of course, my basic was can we have animals in a show which having animals that could be happy, which was a big concern of myself. Uh, and because I didn't know horses, obviously, I had to explore a lot. It took me a long time. It took me uh, almost 10 years from the ID to the, uh, to the first show of Cavalia. And I just wanted to make sure that if I bring horse to a show, they would be happy horse. And that was the entire challenge of creating Cavalia. And that's why Cavalia became so popular, because when you get to see Cavalia, of course, there is horses. Of course, there is acrobat, music, special effects, lighting. But most likely, you see happy horses. Uh, and you see a real bond between the trainer and, and the horse, and the artist and the horse. And that is the signature we had. So, after I created Cavalia, that's a long answer. After we created Cavalia in 2003, I thought I was not, I did not push enough the integration of the performing arts into the horse world. So I just wanted to create something bigger. And also as a touring show, I created Odysseo in 2011. And this is the one that is now here in San Jose. But you know, you don't need to be a horse person to enjoy the show because there's a lot, a lot of special effects. It's a huge production, it's one of a kind, uh, and obviously, uh, I don't think, as a touring show again, uh, it, it's comparable to any of the best uh, permanent show that you can witness in Las Vegas because of the quality of the production. I, I just wanted to push what could be achieved on a, on a tour as, you know, production-wise. So the lights are very modern. The projection, we have 3D image uh, projection, like we have a, a screen that is about three times an IMAX theater screen. And it, it supports what I call the first and only 6D show in the world. <laughs> I'm, I'm no, I'm, I know I'm at Google here, so <laughs> better be careful what I say. But why is it 6D? I wanted to explain that, if I may. Because the stage is very deep, and we use the stage as layer. So when the first image you have, when you see the show, you see a forest, and then the forest disappear, and then you see a mountain. It's a real mountain. Uh, it peaks at about 33 feet high. And behind the mountain, you have that, that giant guess gigantic screen. And in between the screen and the mountain, you can see horse appearing. And you feel like you're watching one of the most beautiful Hollywood movie, but you're there alive. So, and the projections are so great. They're, all, they're HD uh, projection, 2D, but very big. So you feel the deepness in the production. So that's why I say, you know, have the 3D live in front, and you have the 3D projection in the back. So 3 plus 3, here you are, 6D. <laughs> yes, I have the six, first 6D show in the world. <laughs> if anyone's here from virtual reality, maybe be taking some notes. <laughs> so on that subject of technology, what is, what the, out of that vision, what is the hardest to actually stage in a live setting? Well, um, you know, when you do a, a, a big production, a big show, and, and, and whatever, if it's, uh, 
you know, whatever type of show, um, you, you run most likely a show with a clock. So, and then you have a time code, and the time code run the music. And then, you know, the, you, you know the length of the show. In Cavalia, both Cavalia and Odysseo, we never know how long it's going to last because we are with animals. And, and the animals, pretty much for half of the show, they're free. When I say free, is they have no bit, no saddle, no ropes. They just they can go wherever. And the stage is huge. The stage is about twice in the hockey ring stage, so it's huge. So if a horse decides to go, he goes. And if he decides not to come, he doesn't come. And if he decides not to leave the stage, he doesn't leave the stage. So all the cues, all the cues are managed manually. We have a stage manager that has thousands of cues, but in addition, she has to watch. We also have the live musician. They have to watch because if the horse doesn't do what we wish he will do, which happens often, and that's the moment I prefer because they express themselves. Um, and, and then, you know, you have to have a show that is flexible. And even with this show supported with, by a lot of technology, I was talking about the I was talking about the images and, and the lights and everything and the special effects, whatever you bring there, um, need to be called one by one by human because we have to follow the horse. Hmm. I don't think I've ever heard of a show that has no end. end that's that's the truth. After every show, I, I look, I'm not there at every show, but the stage manager made uh, a stage report and it, the show varies from 5 to 10 to 15 minutes at every show. There's a lot of improvisation. And, and you know, coming back to what I was saying, my goal was to have happy horse. So first, you know, people can say, you know, horse and animal don't, shouldn't uh, be on stage. But what I learned, you know, through my search, because I didn't know nothing about horses, I just repeat that because it's very true. I could barely see a difference between a cow and a horse 20 years ago, to tell you the truth. I'm a guy from the city, you know, I'm not a guy from the country. And, you know, yeah, you go in front of a field, you look at the horse, you look at the cow and say, oh, there are two animals, they're very happy. But, you know, when you go, when you go closer, when you start to look, there are domesticated animals. Uh, they are, uh, they live with the, they, if it wouldn't be of the human intervention, intervention in the horse world, they wouldn't exist anymore because this, they were surrounded by predator. Um, and, and so the horse, the breeds we have today are man-made, like, like dogs. You know, all the dogs, there's no wolf in our house. The horse is the same thing. And they have all the horse, all the breeds have a speciality, like they have a purpose. So if, if you start to describe, like here we have the, a lot of the American quarter horse. They're, they're made for cutting and for um, you know, going to the field and bringing the, the uh, beef, uh, the cattle. Yeah, it was, yeah, <laughs> cattle horse. And then you have the horse that uh, do jumping competition. And that's what they do, they jump. Uh, but those horses are not, you know, they have a different confirmation that the quarter horse. And then we have a lot of what we call the Spanish horse or the Iberian horse, which are made um, by the Spanish or the Lipizzaner is the same from the Russia. Or uh, you have the same from the Lusitanos, which are from Portugal. They were made for war. And, and, and also the, the Spanish made them to, to pull carriage, but very like with an aristocrat carriage. Am I okay with the English? Mm -hmm. And then so you see those, what we call the Spanish horse, very elegant horses walking like this. So all the horse have been created by men for those specific purpose. What is fantastic about Odysseo and Cavalia and what is fantastic about, you know, how stupid I was to think that I brought to the horse world different type of horses doing different type of stuff and I put them all in one show where, you know, if you go to a horse competition or horse show, uh, all day long, you know, if you see a jumping competition, all day long you see horses jumping, you know, after one, two, three, four, five, you say, okay, what's else? <laughs> Which I, I I'm, you know, I was not 
there for doing a horse show. I was there for doing performing arts with horses. So I do have horse that jump, do have horse for that, you know, dance. We do have horse what we call at liberty, where they just play with their trainer and, and it, it created a world apart. That's what is Odysseo and true Cavalia also. We, we did definitely created something that didn't exist before. And when you see it, it is so spectacular. And you see these horses doing their, their performance seamlessly. But I'm sure there are some breeds or some horses with personalities or uh, they have their own quirks. Are there some that are harder to train, easier to train? Yeah, I mean, they're like uh, human. <laughs> or they are like any, you know, any, anyone living in this planet. They don't learning the same speed between them. They, are, they're not, um, they don't behave the same way. And sometimes we could have horses that we could buy very expensive. We train them, we bring them to the tour. And after a couple of months, we say, this is not his cup of tea. And we just remove him. Um, because you know these horses. What is uh, it, you always have to look at a, a, a horse or any animal, the way they behave in nature to see if they are comfortable or not. And horses are surrounded in nature by predator. We are a predator for the horse, so he can get very scared. But the moment you give him the comfort, if you don't hit him, if you don't you know beat him, if you don't push him too hard, if you tell him slowly, or if you follow the way he is to learn what he has to do, he'll be more than pleased. He will give you 10 times more. But some horses come, they achieve that, they're good, uh, they're ready to go in the show, and they arrive in front of 2,000 people and they say, oh, why am I here? <laughs> and that happened. And, and after a month or two, if we feel that the horse is just scared and get very nervous, we just remove. We just say, OK, this is not is. And other horses, and, and it's very fantastic, because they don't behave the same if, if there are public or no public. They are really stars. They wait for the applause, you know. <laughs> and there are no applause. This is, this is boring. I, I, I'm telling you, it's, it might <laughs> sound silly, but this is how they are. They are very, you know, they, are, they have emotion. They, they, the horse we have like what they do. Uh, and they live, and it's very important, they live in herd. And when you visit the stable, uh, they're always in the same position. They always have the same neighbor. So they're very social animals. And, and when they come on stage, we make them feel that the stage is not a place to work. It's a place to play. Horse, you know, they like two things in life. They like to eat and they like to play. And so if you give them food and then you, you bring them to a playground as huge as our stage, the horse can be very happy. That sounds like a pretty nice life for a horse. <laughs> yeah. how, how is it that you rotate horses on and off? The ones who have proven themselves, yeah. at least. Well, in Odyssey, we have, uh, we have almost 70 horses uh, touring. And the Cavalia, we have 40 horses. And the company owns about 200 of them in total. So we have a farm in Canada, and we just supply horse as, you know. And some horse, most of the horse will not stay longer than four years or five years. Not that because they're tired, of, uh, they just get bored. And we want to give them some you know, pasture at one point. They like to eat green. And when you're on tour, they have paddocks outside. Like even in downtown San Jose, they have paddocks. But it's not the most comfortable paddock. You know, they look at the green, and there's only sand. So it's good for them. It's good for the mantle to go to, to pasture. So after four years, if they're young horses and happy performers, we remove them for two years and bring them back. And we have a team, complete team, that is taking care of the renewal of the horse, but also the people. Because sometimes we hired acrobats who know nothing about horses, because we have a cast of 45. Half of them are at acrobat base, and the other <coughs> half are uh, horse riders, trainers uh, based. So we have to teach the, the horse rider how to become acrobats. And the opposite way around. Some of the acrobats have to learn how to be with horses. And we, have, uh, we, we like to have multi-skills uh, human. 
but we also like to have multi-skills horses, which is very unique in our world because uh, everyone who has a horse know that the horse will ride a certain way. You know, if he's riding English saddle, he's riding English saddle. If he's riding uh, Western saddle, it's Western saddle. If, or if you have a jumping horse, that's all he does, he jumps, you know. But our horse, uh, we ask, we try to bring them to three different disciplines, which make them even more happy, because every time they come on the show, they don't know what they're going to do. So it's just bring their mind to something different. I compare often a uh, horse to kids, three years old kids, more or less, two and a half, three years old. So, you know, they're very, especially boys, they're very unpredictable. I say that because I had two boys. So they're very unpredictable and, and the horse are the same thing. But if you bring something to them that lit and make them want to play and be happy, you have you know, the best friend of the, of the world. How, what is kind of the day in the life of these horses? Yeah, um, so the, um, uh, you know, they have uh, six meal a day, <laughs> mostly hay. We like to give them hay during the entire day because it keeps them occupied. Again, you just have to reproduce what they are in, in, in the field or in the nature. So they're trying always to find, if you see a horse, in the field, you rarely see a horse head up, always down, looking for little bits and bites of, of grass. So we feed them six times a day, and that starts very early in the morning, because horse, they do sleep down, for the one who don't know. They do sleep down, but never more than 40, 45 minutes, and then they go up. And it's also very interesting to watch them, because when one go down, the next one stay up, because he's yeah, checking to make sure that everything is fine. And then when this one will go up, this one will go down for 40 minutes, but not longer than 40 minutes because they need to eat, because they eat grass. You know, if, if it's, it's like us, if we eat only salad all day long, I promise you, you will eat at least 10 meal a day. Uh, <laughs> and, and the horse is the same thing because they eat only grass. So, uh, and then the riders arrive, so they get groomed and all that, and then the riders arrive, or the trainer arrive, about 10 in the morning, and uh, the horse rotate, they go outside every day for one hour, and then they do 40 minutes of just warming up, just walking or running, you know, mostly free. And later during the day, they do probably half an hour of real training, more, you know, what, what they are best at or their skills. And before the show, they get 20 minutes of warm up again, and then they do the show. Average of stay for a horse on stage, average is about 10 minutes. So it's, some, some people ask me if horse are intelligent. Uh, obviously based, compared to human, based on the number of hours they work during the day, they're very intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can appreciate that, <laughs> absolutely. How, so when the riders are working with them, or maybe not even necessarily riders, but especially the liberty portions where the horses are free, yeah. just following their person, how do, you, how, does, how do you train a horse to do that? You know, most of the regular people who are not working in the horse world, uh, like, you know, you have horses, I know you have horses, but you know, you have to work, uh, and you have to sleep, and, and then you spend some certain maybe three, four hours with your horse a week. Uh, our trainers spend, you know, they start, they spend 10 hours a day with their horse, and we have the luxury of time. So that's why we don't push them for training. We just wait for them to be ready. We're slowly training them. And, it's, it's, and, and then you start to create a real bound. And there's one part in the show, uh, that you have about 40 horses free and you have eight people just leading them. And this is, this is the most amazing part because uh, it's like a ballet. It's, it's hard to exp explain and they have no ropes, nothing. And the horse just follow their trainer. They follow the trainer because they like the trainer. It's their friend, and this is why that's happening. And, you know, people from the horse world look at this and say, how? how how the hell have you done that? It is difficult to do it when one horse, to get followed by a horse, you know, if you walk in the field or in the paddock, 
for make sure that the horse is following you is it's an achievement. So we have 40 of them following eight people, which is absolutely spectacular. And it's very beautiful. And this is where you can notice that the horse are happy to do it because they just follow. They just they're just their friend. Are there little bits of carrots in the pocket? Good or? question. The, the answer is no. We, we, we do give carrots, uh, when, but after they have done what they had to do. Otherwise, the horse will just ask for it, which uh, will not be funny. And also, <laughs> if you give too much carrots to the horse that work, uh, or is at work, we call it at work, but when you come on stage or he will just have his mind set for carrots, where uh, us uh, to reward a horse is a caress. So just, we just thank him with the end, and he knows we're happy uh, that what he has achieved. So he's not there asking. But we do have a lot of carrots backstage <laughs> <laughs> in the stable. <laughs> I don't know how, how much we spend in carrots, but it's a big budget. <laughs> I can believe that. Um, so the horses are unpredictable, although they're trained. The audience, I would think, is even more unpredictable. How, how, how do you deal with any, anything that comes up with the audience or something that is out of your control? Well, we give, not carrots, but we give popcorn to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Better control. <laughs> um, you know, since we are doing Odysseo, since the first show, that was five years ago, we're about to have five years old in October, I have not, I don't know how many thousands of performances we've done, but um, I have not seen one show where the audience doesn't stand up at the end of the show. And this is a gift for a creator to see at, every, at the end of every performance 2,000 people or whatever there is, because there's 2,000 seats, whatever there is in the audience, standing up and applauding. And I see people crying and other laughing and being happy. So that's, that's why I do that. You know, I ju I'm just trying to bring a little bit of happiness on this earth. And you can see people have enjoy this show. And, and I can say, you know, after touring it for so many years, I can say, it might sound pretentious, but that's probably one of the best show that exists on the planet. You have, uh, you have to experience it because people will say, "Oh, it's a horse show." You know, I'm not, I'm not a horse person. Doesn't matter. Just you know, it's, it's just a feel-good show. It's a good a show that will give you like, you know, bring your spirit, elevate your spirit. It made me happy. <laughs> Very Good. happy. Um, I, does anyone have any questions in the audience they want to ask? Which is the favorite breed of horses? Because I noticed some Arabians out there, which yeah. I happen to have one. <laughs> so which is the favorite, smartest, easiest to teach? Um, you know, it depends what you ask them to do. Like for the Arabian, we have a lot of Arabian because we do what we call liberty. And they are very playful. That's why we like them. And also, uh, they like to stay in herd more than the other horse. They are very uh, inclined to, to be part of a group. So when we do liberty, at one point, there's uh, about 12 horses coming. And there's a, depend on the show, from 8 to 12. Um, but uh, they all behave together and they all act together and they're totally free. And there's one girl, her name is Elise Verdun. She's the main trainer for those horses. And they just, they just, and also I think they are very elegant, the way and, and the Arabian for the one who don't know, like when they start to be happy or like you see, it's a little bit like the dogs for the tail, but the tail goes up and it's, it's very nice. They're very beautiful, very elegant and light or so they can just achieve like, it's like a vals. I see it like a vals. So that's why we have a lot of Arabian. But uh, that have been said, are they easier to train than other horses? I don't think so. I think the most easiest horse to train, obviously, are the American quarter horse, because they are cold. Uh, you know, we're, we call it cold blood. They're a little bit colder and really nothing affect them. And, and you can see why the cowboys, you know, used to shoot gun 
uh, well, over a, a quarter horse because he's just like, yeah, okay, something is going on. <laughs> Where if you do that with an Arabian, I'm telling you, he's away, you know, as far as he could. So that's that's why. So that that you know that Arabian like to have you know movement, and that's why we we have a lot for this liberty uh, part. Um, what's the ideal age that you'll introduce horses to the program? Like, will you take like two, three-year-olds that are newly broke? Will you take a 16-year-old horse who's been doing something else his own life? Like, what do you tend to aim for with the age of your horses? Yeah, very good question. First, we don't breed horse. We, we buy horses that are already full uh, confirmated. Con, con, con. What, uh, conform. conform, I'm sorry, looking for the word. Fully conform, so we know what we buy. So we know how it look, how he behave. Uh, so usually, you know, we rarely buy horses under three years old. Most likely we like to buy them at four or five, but with the minimal of being what you call in English broken. I don't like this word, but that's the word we use. Um, so minimally ridden, um, but not too much, because if you take a horse that have been trained by somebody too difficult, uh, then you have a difficult horse. Um, so that's why we try to buy them you know, around four or five. We will sometime find an exception, you know, six, seven horse, uh, six, seven years old horse. But And uh, we don't keep them on tour. There's no horses over right now. I think the oldest is 16 or 17 years old. And we still have some horses that were there in Cavalia, actually, that in 2003, uh, one of the first horses I bought is a quarter horse, his name is Choice, and he's at the farm. And when I used to go there more often, but a couple of years ago, I would used to do hamburgers, and he was coming next to me because he was free on the farm. So <laughs> coming, helping me for hamburgers. But uh, no, but um, uh, the, these horses can live. When they leave the tour, it's not because they are finished. It's just because it's time for them to leave after 16, 17 years old. We find them either in that adoption place or we bring them to our farm. The, I think over the past 30 years or so, the Quebecois Circus, from Cirque du Soleil to Cavalia to Odessio, has really you know, reshaped that, that whole genre. Um, why do you think that is? What have you seen change you know, from, from, your, from the early days to now? Yeah, this is a very difficult question to answer. You know, how you define... How come, and, and it's true, when you travel around the world and you see the entertainment, live entertainment world, you see a lot of people from Quebec, like my province, like from Montreal and Quebec. Why is that? I cannot answer. It's maybe something in the water or... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, to tell you the truth. That, that I've been said, you know, we um, are a mix of, um, you know, I consider myself a mix of American and European, and that's probably we get the influence of the both world. And because we're a very small, tiny French community, we're only three million people over that, you know, ocean of English speaking, we probably have developed some skills of fighting and trying to express ourselves differently. That's maybe one of the reason, uh, but uh, and and I was there for the uh, beginning of Cirque, and you know I've, after Cirque, as I as you know now, I've started Cavalia, and I think it's this behind like me and other people is the idea of to trying to do something new, different, and push the limit. And that's 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 probably what it is. I, that's what it is for me actually. When you're doing the live performances, is there like a guideline or rule of thumb, particularly during the Liberty portions, where if one of the horses is not cooperating, someone will sort of remove the horse from the stage, or will you always just keep going and trying to bring the horse back into the performance? Most of the time, we try to bring them back to the performance. It did happen. It did happen. You know, it could happen that. You know, if a horse really uh, start to be, because we have a lot of stallions, okay? We have only male horses and we have a lot of stallions. So if stallions start to behave very badly, which could happen, uh, at that time we will take a rope, take his, you know, a longe and bring him out. But that happened very rarely. Um, most of the time we leave them 
what I call express himself. And after a while, you know, uh, him, because I've seen horses running for three minutes, you know, and running and kicking and having fun. So uh, the, the rule is let him, let him, if he's not dangerous for the horses, let him do. And after two, three minutes, you know, it's just, <laughs> okay, what do I do now? And then he's coming back, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, this is nature. This is so easy. You just have to read. And it's also very interesting because I, I, I repeat that to uh, whoever is next to horses, uh, probably because I'm not next to horses, I can say it. I say to the people, you know, the horse never make mistake. It's the human who make mistake. It's just changing the perspective is, you ask something to the horse, if he doesn't do it, it's because you didn't ask right or you didn't take took the time to uh, for him to let, let him answer right. And that's that's what is the philosophy behind. You know. But it's easy to say for me, but you know, for the, the trainers, some some you know, some of the girls are five feet four inches next to a horse that is twice her size. I can see sometimes and say, oh, okay, that's a nice philosophy, but it's a big animal. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a question of balance. I think it's always, you know, that's in life. Everything in life for me, it's a question of balance. It's the same thing next to an animal, even more next to any animal. It's a question to balance. If you want to dominate too much, he won't like you. If you want to be his friend, he will like you. What was your childhood like? How did your parents influence you? And if your mother was here, what would she say was the first sign that you would be who you are today? Oh, that's a, a moving question because my mother just passed away about eight months ago. So, um, and my mother, even if I was doing very stupid and crazy thing when I was young, uh, which my father didn't like, but my mother always supported me. And that this is probably that what my mother gave me the courage of going to as far as my ID uh, are bringing me to. Uh, even, you know, because I'm one of the rare guy who has the two boat, I'm, I'm producing the show. Uh, so financially I'm involved and I'm creating the show. So which is very rare. Usually you see someone who create and you find someone who f bring the money in and produce. I have the two and the only why the reason why I'm like that probably is because nobody at first when I started to talk about I'm going to do a great show with horses, they were looking at me. And if you go to a producer or whoever has money to tell him I'm going to do a great show with horses, it's going to be very, you know, modern and, you know, 10 years ago people just come, don't come. So I say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support my ID. Uh, the reality is the producer suffer more than the creator because I'm spending so much money. <laughs> but I'm just pushing my idea as far as I could, and that's probably from, from uh, my mother. And, you know, because you, it's become very personal also uh, in my family. Uh, my oldest brother is disabled, uh, and, uh, and I've been very supportive of him, even when he... Even today, he's uh, 60, 66 or 67 right now. Very supportive of him, but uh, I always felt I was very blessed compared to him. And I always felt, even when I was young, I had to do twice more because he couldn't do what he, you know, what he deserved. And, and I just always pushed the limit, you know. It's probably the combination of two. I, I was born, uh, I like to say I was born on a sidewalk. Uh, I, I passed my young age in an alley uh, and my, I become teenager in the street for, <laughs> that's probably how to resume my life. And then when I grow up, I just travel around the world. That's, that's, that's who I am. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed in the uh, in the teaser clip there was um, there was a pool of water and some of the horses were going through the water and the acrobats were jumping through the water. Do you have you actually have a pool on stage and does that introduce other kind of difficulties or challenges? Uh, definitely, a lot of challenges. We get uh, we fill the stage um, uh, again. You know, the stage is about the size of hockey ring. We filled it in about one minute thirty second with 40,000 gallons of water. Again, this is a touring show, okay? So 
Uh, it's very complicated um, because you know we we change location everywhere we go, so it has to be total level because if it's not level, you know what happened with the water. Uh, so it's very challenging. Uh, it's one of the most technically challenging part of the show. But uh, I thought I wanted the the Odysseo is 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 like let's say the the word it's an Odyssey where. Men and horses go to discover the most beautiful landscape in the world. So they, it's, it's, they're just traveling together. That's why I call it Odyssey. And the end, O, is because of the water coming. Uh, and, and I think you cannot, uh, and, and the stage uh, reveal a lot about nature. So you cannot reveal about nature without talking about the water, which is the source of life, which is also you know where uh, animals meet. If you go to anywhere, the animals, every kind of animals meet, including human, around a, a source of water. And I could not do a show talking about the relationship of men and horses and traveling throughout the world without having water, Great. even if it's very challenging. Yes. <laughs> because this, this show, you know, I, I, again, you have to see it, but it's the biggest touring show in the world. We have about 120 semi-trailer when we move. If you compare to uh, you know, the biggest rock and roll tour, or Rolling Stone or U2, they have only 65. You know? <laughs> so, so I mean, it's a big tour. I've, when you go see, and the big tent is one of a kind, because I wanted to have, I didn't, have, I didn't want to have the feeling of a circus. I, I just, I'm not a circus guy, you know, where you see the ring and everything goes in the round. I didn't want that. So I, we really created a space that is like a real auditorium. And people are sitting auditorium like here, facing the stage. But the stage is very, very big. And there's no obstruction. Most of the tent you see in the world, even Cirque du Soleil tent, the big one, uh, you see mast next to the stage. When you get to see uh, Odysseo, you see no obstruction. There's no mast. Everything is supported by, if you pass nearby the, the, the tent over there, you see three arches. We support 80 tons of equipment there, uh, but with these arches. So it's a, it's a really, uh, if you are into engineering, just go and watch carefully. It's a marvel of engineering. This is just an amazing engineering piece because when you tour, a uh, rock and roll tour in arena, usually they, the maximum weight they put to the ceiling is, 80, is 50 tons, and we have 80. One of the most uh, important element of the show is a merry-go-round that appear from the ceiling. Again, you're under a tent. You're not you know, into a permanent theater. And the merry-go-round is very big, weight 18 tons. And we do an acrobatic act on it. And it's just, and this part, I mean, you've seen it. It's just magical and bring you to a dream world. And, and again, you know, this is because I, I push the idea of, you know, and make it happen. That's, that's the thing. You just have an idea and you make it happen. So whatever it costs, whatever, is it possible or not, let's do it. And that's, that's what is defining pretty much Odysseo. You have dozens of horses. Do you ever acquire horses as your show is traveling? Because I mean, you're in places where there's horse communities or yeah, know, horse. Yeah, we do. We do yes. actually. Yeah, we do. We have uh, horses. Uh, like yesterday, I was talking to one of the groom, and we have one horse from Australia because Cavalia went to Australia, and after a while, we brought the horse back to North America, and he's now touring with Odysseo. So, and we have horses from. Arizona, because we were in Arizona with horses from uh, California. And, you know, we always look for good horses, and, you know, they are everywhere. There's no, no specific place where we buy horses. And, but of course, we have a lot of, again, you know, just might repeat here, but we have a lot of Spanish horse. So these ones, of course, we, we go to, to buy them in Spain. But other than that, we buy through the course of the tour. All right, two more quick questions. Which market is have you made the most money in or is most popular where you have the, the most response? And have you ever thought of having a permanent show, like a permanent building? Yeah. Um, well, with, uh, with, uh, there's a big difference between Cavalia and Odiseo. 
Cavalia, he made money. Odysseo is spending money. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's worth it for you to go see <laughs> how you spend money. <laughs> uh, no, without, uh, with no joking. I mean, California is a very good, very good market. We were in San Francisco not long ago. We did fantastic. We just arrived uh, a couple of months ago from Irvine. We're returning to Irvine. So California is a great market. Also, you know, the, the, uh, in terms of economies, which is very important, when you are into entertainment, live entertainment in California, you don't pay tax, which I mean on the ticket. Uh, if you go back where I live, uh, you pay 15% of tax. So it, it, it does make a big difference. It's Something you're not taxed on. I'm sorry? It's the one thing in California you're not taxed on. Well, the, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you have other tax. I don't say you don't have tax. I just say we're not taxed because we're live entertainment, which That's is good. fantastic, uh, which is fantastic. So in terms of business, doing business in California is f very good for us. Um, f where we've stayed the longest, um, actually, we return many times, so it's hard to say. But Cavalia, the first show, is now in China has been performing in Beijing for six months, and we are still extending. So this is, this is a, a, re a revelation, because we don't know, we didn't know, and, and there's no horses in China. There's very, very little. There's a lot of horses in their culture, a lot of horses in their might mythology, but the reality is there's not that many horses in China, very little, uh, unless you go far north. Uh, so that I've been said, uh, the first show for whoever has seen it, the first show, there's two small horses that open this, the, the, the first act. And here, you know, we see horses, you know, we applaud, and it's the beginning of the show. Over there, they're like kids. I'm talking about the audience. And you, you hear, ooh. <laughs> Every show is, is surprising because they don't see live uh, live horses, you know, you're in the middle of Beijing. I don't know if you, any of you have been to Beijing, but it's a, a monster city. I mean, uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles are very small compared to Beijing. So uh, that's where we spend a lot of time. And of course, uh, Montreal, my hometown. I mean, you know, when we go there, we're big stars. So. <laughs> At least one city we're big star in the world. <laughs> My own city. <laughs> we do very good business in Canada too. Thank you. My question is: so you commented a little bit on the logistics. You have like 120 trailers that are going. Yeah, so my there. trailer. For I'm just trying to seal. imagine all the people that you need. To, you have 45 performers, I think you mentioned. You've got people that have to take care of the horses. You need to you know, set up the tents, the lighting, the, the orchestra, the musicians. All that. How many people are touring with you, and how do you handle all these logistics? Yeah. Um, we have 120 semi, uh, 100, <laughs> I was going to say 120 semi-trailer. That's true. But 120 permanent staff uh, touring with us full time. We run the show at about 200 people, so the 80 people every day are local people. When we set up, when we move, because we move this uh, big tour in about 17 days, from the last show in the city to the first show in the next city, um, and then we are about 200 per day, about 200 to 250 people per day to help to set up and dismantling. So it's. Uh, um, the logistic is, uh, you know, we, I guess we get used to it. We have fantastic people taking care of all the details. A lot of, uh, there's a lot to be done, a lot to achieve. It's like, I guess, you know, it's like a little bit like the army. When it's time to move, you just pack your truck and you just move <laughs> and set up on the next city. And then, you know, it goes from also personal logistic because they are, we, everyone live in apartment. But you know what it is when you tour, you just, yeah, you start with one luggage and then you have two, three, four, five. There's a rider who left us uh, yesterday after five years of touring. She went back home and she said, I don't know how I'm going to do. I have seven luggage. And I said, oh, I don't think Air Canada will accept seven luggage from you. <laughs> but the, the reality is we, you know, we have to have a container, and we call it extra luggage container, and it's all part of you know what what we do, and a lot of, and it's mainly you know because we have very good people who do it. There are many really magical parts of your show. Um, one of the 
parts that was most astounding as, a, as someone who's ridden horses was um, there's a trick rider who goes under the belly of the horse and back up to the top while the horse is galloping. Mm. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about like how long they've trained for that? I've, I've never seen anything like that before. That was just amazing. So, or like where that trick came from. Yeah, well, uh, we call it this, this number, we call it Kozak riding. And it's from uh, the uh, far part of Russia. The, 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 they've started this type of riding over there. Um, and the guy, there are very few guys who uh, are doing it. But the reality, if you look carefully, this, the horse that, that does it is very tall. And he has, this guy has enough place to move. Uh, but you have to establish a real trust because nobody's riding the horse. He's just going full speed and around. You don't want to stop you want him to stop. You don't want him to go slow down. So it, you know they, they get to train him, and finally he goes under the belly and come back after every show. And uh, it, it's very spectacular, very scary. I'm still, you know, my warm, my hand gets wet every time I see him <laughs> doing it. Will I do it? No. <laughs> but he's an athlete, and he, that's what he does for a living, believe it or not. <laughs> but it's very impressive. It's a, and there's, you know, the show brings you to a, a, a lot of action sometimes, and sometimes it's very smooth, beautiful. And it's, it's really, a, a, you know, this show brings you to a lot of, uh, you know, it, it just, it's just a feel-good show. After the show, you say, wow, OK, I've seen something different. I've seen something that animals believe well. Uh, they've seen happy. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's just a beautiful show, I think. You know, and you just said it, but I, I like to repeat it, because uh, that's, there's nothing harsh in the show. There's nothing that you can say, oh, you know, it's, it's just beautiful. That's, what, that's the idea behind. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much.